Today, let's talk about God's timing because not all of us are really happy with it. Sometimes we're waiting for a long time for God to do things in our life, like fix our marriage or bring a wayward child home. And we're frustrated because we hate the waiting time. Join us today as I help you work through that. All right, good morning. Welcome to our Encouraging Truth series. Super glad you are joining us today. Today, I want to talk about God's timing. And I want to encourage you with this. Encouraging Truth number 84 is this. God's timing is always the right timing. And right off the bat, you're like, I hate that statement. Because for a lot of people, we're waiting. We're waiting on God to do something in our life. Like, we want him to hurry up and fix our marriage. We want him to bring our wayward child home. We want him to heal a sickness. We want him to help us find a job. And it's so frustrating when none of those things seem to be happening. We had a dog once, a little multi poo, and he was white, and he would always run around and just get, he was just a disaster from being outside. And it's so cute because we would have him groomed, and he would hate being groomed. He would hate the process. It would be so long and involved and, and a lot of work and actually probably a lot of pain because he had that long hair. But in the end, in the end, he loved it. He loved feeling clean and being clean, but he hated the waiting part to make that happen. And most of us, we feel the same way. But here's what we need to remember is that most of our lives actually consist of waiting. When we had our own business um, many years ago, four of our boys worked at home with Rob. And they actually worked in an office building. And then one day, after all the kids were in school and, and everyone was gone, Rob would get up, he'd leave the house, I'd have the whole house to myself so I could study and do what I needed to do. But then suddenly he came home one day and said, hey, we're going to all move home, we're going to move the office home. And I'm like, what? <laughs> okay, and so they did, but I thought it was just a few month thing, but it ended up to be three years later, three years of waiting for everyone to move back out into an office. But this picture I had to show this to you because this kind of probably threw them over the edge and is why they ended up moving out. Because here, here's Jesse, he's on his computer and our dog is staring in the window at him. <laughs> But between uh, the dogs barking and, and no room, you know, all the kids were in one room, one, one office, and, and they'd have to run to the bathroom if there was an important call, and it was, it, was just, it was just kind of a disaster. But they had to wait, and they had to wait until the company grew and they had enough money to actually move into an office building, and it took way longer than they ever wanted it to, to happen. So what I want to do is just tell people that waiting is normal. That's why I always tell people, you need to open your Bible. You need to see what God has to say about waiting because waiting all through the Bible is like the norm. Like think about Noah. He had to wait 120 years to build a boat and then for the flood to happen. God tells Abraham, hey, you're going to have a son. Great. 25 years later, David is anointed king when he's a teenager probably, I don't know, 14, 15, 16 years old. He didn't become king until he was 30. And so in the meantime, he just goes back and starts tending sheep like, I don't know, I guess I'm just going to wait and do what I'm used to doing. So when we read the stories in the Bible, we can actually relax knowing this, that during the waiting time, God is always working behind the scene. For the last few weeks, we've been talking about Joseph. At this particular time, his older 10 stepbrothers sold him to slave traders um, on, on their way to Egypt. He was sold uh, on the slave market to a man by the name of Potiphar. Potiphar loved Joseph, had so much respect for him, and apparently Potiphar's wife felt the same way about Joseph. Joseph was probably around, I don't know, 18 at the time. The Bible kind of alludes to the fact that he was kind of hot. And his wife, Potiphar's wife, tries to get Joseph to sleep with her. And he refuses. He's like, absolutely not. I'm not only loyal to your husband, but I am loyal to my God. I would never do that. So Mrs. Potiphar decides to get back at Joseph. 
He runs away from her and she starts screaming rape. Her husband throws Joseph into prison and the sad part is that Joseph is thrown into prison for doing something right. Which is just this great reminder to those of you who maybe were fired from a job because you refused to lie to your boss. You did something right and you got penalized for that basically. Uh, some of you, your husbands were, you know, say, hey, you need to watch porn with me. And when you don't, they, they leave you, you know. So sometimes that happens. Many times doing the right thing can actually bring on hardship. But it also shows us in this story about Joseph that, that even though that happens, God is still right in the midst of it. Even if we're persecuted for doing something good. So in prison, Joseph meets two people, a cupbearer and a baker. And they both have dreams that they can't seem to interpret, and they're both really frustrated. So the one thing that God has given Joseph is the ability to um, interpret dreams. So Joseph prays, and God reveals what these dreams mean for the cupbearer and the baker. Now, bad news for the baker, uh, Joseph says, yeah, you're going to die. I'm like, sorry, the, the king's going to kill you. But for the, the cupbearer, it was really, really good news that he would be restored to service with the king. I think that Joseph was excited about that because he knew once the cupbearer got out and talked to Pharaoh, then he would say, hey, this guy, you need to get him out of jail. Look at Genesis 40, verse 20. Thus it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. But he restored the chief cupbearer to his office, and he put the cup, of Pharaoh, cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had interpreted to them. Now in Joseph's mind, he's like just waiting, waiting around, like, hey, I know someone's going to come get me out of jail. But that never, ever happened. Look at verse 23. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. He forgot him. You're like, what just happened? But here's the key. When God is involved, until it's his perfect timing, it won't happen. But here's a really, really good point. You don't want it to happen if God's not in it. See, we can try to force things in our life. We can cry. We can carry on. We can shake our fist at God. We can try to do things on our own. But it's never going to work out if God is not in it. We don't want it to work out if God is not in it. If you're a follower of Christ, then you can be absolutely assured that in God's perfect timing, he is going to make things happen. He's going to open doors. He's going to stop things from happening. He's going to close the doors you're not supposed to go through. Because he has a place for you to be. And sometimes the waiting is involved in, in all of that. What we learn from Joseph is something that we can see in his life in hindsight. That God had a plan for Joseph. He needed Joseph in Egypt to save everyone from this famine that was coming. And that's why God did not release Joseph. He had to wait two more years in order to be released. Two more years of waiting. But God had a purpose in those two years. I think for all of Joseph's disappointment, and I, and I want us to really think about what, what has been over these last couple of weeks. Joseph's been disappointed in the waiting. I, I get that. Like God rocked his entire world. God moved him from the comfort of his home. And he's sold into slavery in a foreign country. And then he's falsely accused and thrown into prison and kept there waiting, waiting, waiting. Here's what we need to know. What we learn is that God uses all things, even things that seem bad, to get us to where we need to be. But the worst part is that it just takes time. And we hate that. Because God's timing can be so incredibly frustrating. We want to get pregnant now. We want grandchildren now. We want the business deal to go through now. We want to have a better marriage now. Uh, we, we want to feel better now. What we need is a good dose of Joseph, which is this. Joseph was not able to see his future. That was a good thing. And we can't see our future either. So when we can't see our future, what that forces us to do and what that forced Joseph to do and what we learn from him is 
He just took each day as it came. You wake up, he helped the prisoners, he probably did some tasks in the prison, he went to bed in order to wake up and do it all over again. Because that's what waiting looks like. It's just doing what you normally do until God changes your situation. For us, as we wake up, we go to work, we take a lunch break, we go back to work, we go home, we eat dinner, we go to bed, and we start the routine all over again. Yet we're able to see something what Joseph was never able to see. We can see, looking back at the story, the hand of God leading and guiding. We see God in all the bad stuff. We see God allowing this hatred to fester in Joseph's brother's hearts. Why? Because God needed Joseph in Egypt. We see God moving in Potiphar's life to hire Joseph, knowing full well that Potiphar's wife would play the role of seductress. Why? Because God needed Joseph in prison. We see the cupbearer or the Pharaoh's anger towards the baker and the cupbearer all as part of God's overall plan because God needed Joseph to interpret their dreams. See, God needed Joseph in front of Pharaoh. God, and all of these things, all the bad things in his life took him to this point where God could use him where he needed him. See, God's timing is always so different than ours. Joseph's waiting around for the cupbearer to remember him. The Bible says the cupbearer forgot him. You're like, how, how does that even happen? This just happened. But we got to get this. That is how amazing the God we serve is. Like God is really honestly that amazing. He controls everything. He oversees everything. He moves on our, the hearts and minds of people. Proverbs 21.1 says this, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Think about that. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the water courses, he turns it whichever way he wills. Your boss's heart is in the hand of the Lord. If he fires you, the hand of the Lord has moved him to do that. Your husband's heart is in the heart of the Lord. God can change your husband's heart to, to go one way or the other way. Your child's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Your situation is in the hand of the Lord. And as a follower of Jesus, that is so reassuring no matter whatever happens. Genesis 41 says this, Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. Behold, he was standing by the Nile, and lo, from the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt, and they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. Then Pharaoh awoke. He fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain came up in a single stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven ears, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now, I would say that's a really, really odd, weird dream. Um, but this dream was so impactful to Pharaoh, he was so frustrated. So verse uh, 41, verse 8 says this, Now in the morning his spirit was troubled. So he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men, and Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. And if this were a play, we would say, Enter, cupbearer, finally. Because now was the time that the cupbearer would remember Joseph because God, remember, controls all of that. Then the cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh saying, I would make mention today of my own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants and he put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief baker. We had a dream on the same night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now a Hebrew youth was with us there, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related them to each, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream. Just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me in my office, but he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. See, here's the really exciting news. God made sure that, that, that the cupbearer forgot Joseph. 
He made sure of that until the right time. And this is what we need to remember. That is how close God is to us through all of our circumstances. See, that's really, really exciting news. See, if someone doesn't hire you or some guy doesn't call you back or you forgot to make that call or you missed the appointment or you missed your plane or whatever, suddenly you look back and go, oh my gosh, God, thank you for that. Like you were in all of that even though I didn't see it. So for Joseph, finally the years of waiting are over. Two years later after the cupbearer is released, Joseph finally gets his big break. What we see is this, God used Joseph's past experiences, his past hurts, his past heartaches, his past injustices, his past relationship, and his gift of interpreting dreams. Can you imagine? Everything in his past that you think is bad, God wants to use those. And this is what he does. He brings them all to come together at the perfect time in order for God to finally be able to use them. And see, the same is true for us. It takes time for God to, to work together to get the people and the jobs and the circumstances to get us where we need to be. Which is why whatever you're waiting for, you can relax. Relax knowing that God does not have all the puzzle pieces put together yet. And just like Joseph, finally the cupbearer remembered him. Isn't it just like God? Like we assume that we have this certain job is perfect for us and then we're turned down for it. And we're like, what just happened? But then a year later, you're like, oh my gosh, I got the, the job of my dreams. We think this particular relationship is gonna last an entire lifetime, but then the, the person breaks up with you. And you're like, what just happened? But then a year later, you meet the perfect guy and this is so suitable for you. See, time spent waiting and wondering and questioning and confused is, is part of life, but I don't want us to live like that. I want us to live with, with peace, knowing that God is going to show up in the most amazing, unimaginable way. And we see this with Joseph. A cupbearer mentions it to Pharaoh, and now here's what happens. Joseph is called by Pharaoh himself. And this moment that will change the history of Egypt and, 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 and Israel and, and the famine and all of these things, it wasn't brought on by good things. It was brought on by his jealous, hateful brothers. This moment when he meets Pharaoh is brought on by his married boss's wife who lied and called rape when it really wasn't. This moment was brought on by a cupbearer who completely forgot that Joseph existed. And God is that big that he can pull all of these circumstances together to get you and I where we're supposed to be. So if your days are dark at this moment and you're feeling like God is just late and he's just never going to show up, he seems to have forgotten you, I want you to remember this with Joseph. God is never late. He's always right on time. But remember this, not our time, but God's time. We have a choice. We can run from God when things get difficult. We can walk away from our faith because he didn't come through when we thought he should. We can become angry with God, assuming he doesn't really care about us. We can stop going to church, stop reading our Bible because we're like, well, this God thing just doesn't work very well. Or we can do what Joseph did. And we can wait on God. And we can wait on his perfect timing. And we can wake up every day continuing walking in faith, regardless if our prayers you know, are seemingly unanswered at the moment. We can wake up each day saying, God, I am going to trust you for today. And we are going to look at every circumstance as God ordained, moving us to a new place eventually at the right time. Because for Joseph, suddenly, out of the blue, he's called to this meeting with Pharaoh. The meeting takes place with a new pair of clothes and a cleanly shaved face, and he meets with them one-on-one. -on -one. Look at this in Genesis 41, 15. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And I have heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph then answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. For all the troubles in Joseph's life, he never turned his back on God. 
He never took credit for having the ability to, to you know, interpret dreams. And there he was standing in front of the most powerful man in Egypt. And Joseph gave all the credit to God, all of it. Because Joseph knew that God alone had given him the capacity and the capability to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. See, when it came time for God to promote Joseph, Joseph was ready. And this is what we learn from Joseph, that God had every moment of Joseph's life in his hand. Not one second was not accounted for as far as God was concerned. And the same goes for you and for me. God has our time in his hands. And, and, and we're that important that the detours and the changes and the waiting are all part of this guiding part that he guides us in our lives, just like he did with Joseph. So our encouraging truth number 84 is this. God's timing is always the right timing. So today, if you're wondering where God is, he's right there with your time in his hands. Trust that, relax, enjoy the ride no matter how rocky it seems. Hope that helps. Have a really good week.